today's presenter is Antonio. Uh, sorry about the pronunciation if I get it wrong. <laughs> it's Antonio Ignacio Sierra Garocho, and he's a consultant midwife for normal, normal birth at UK NHS Trust, as well as a professional midwifery advocate. Uh, he started his career in healthcare in 2002 and has worked across a variety of medical and maternity wards across Wales, Wales, Berkshire, Hertfordshire, and London, both as a registered nurse and midwife. Uh, he's passionate about a different aspect of maternity care. His clinical research interests lie in promotion of normality, women's advocacy, and clinical education. Uh, he's specifically interested in the subject of women's experiences and research, perception of breach presentation at birth after a cesarean section. Uh, he supports the midwifery, obstetric, and neonatal terms in clinical practice using the four pillars of, of consultancy clinical and professional leadership, expert practice, service development, research and evaluation, and education and professional development. Uh, he's currently involved in a number of local and regional projects that will focus on the implementation of better births. Uh, he's clinically involved in the delivery of care, including the design of complex care plans and the running of birth options and birth after cesarean section clinics. Uh, he's also a student at the University of East Anglia, completing a pre-doctoral program as part of Health Education England's Integrated Clinic Clinical Academic Program. Uh, his current research focus is in LGBTQ plus health and childbirth. So thank you very much, Antonio, and please welcome him. And over to you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me well, Elisa? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for the um, uh, wonderful introduction as well. Good evening, everyone in the United Kingdom, and hi, um, absolutely everyone joining us from different parts of the world. It's such a, an absolute pleasure to be here today to talk to you um, about the subject of a breach. So my name is Antonio Sierra. Um, introductions have been uh, done already. So thank you for your time today. I'm happy International Day of the Midwife. We've got loads of reasons to be proud about who we are professionally and personally and the contributions that we make to society. Uh, today, um, however, <laughs> we're going to focus, we're going to narrow on this subject of women's uh, experiences of breach diagnosis. Um, and I call this presentation, What About Us? Because very often women tell us that they feel that their voices are unheard. I feel very um, strongly and very passionate about the subject of advocacy, being that voice for the unheard. Um, and I hope that I can take you through a journey. Hopefully you will enjoy these slides. They will be recorded and they can be accessed at a later date. So thank you for your time. Right, so uh, we'll start talking to you about the aim and the research questions. So basically this forms the basics of a dissertation that I completed for my uh, master's in midwifery science. Um, I'll talk to you a bit um, about, you know, give you an introduction and also navigate through a literature review that I undertook. And then I'll explain what research methods I went for. Um, and also we will talk about the results, the discussion and the limitations of the research. Um, I will uh, inform you of what the recommendations were at the time and what we've managed to achieve to date. And finally, we will be um, uh, making a point about the subject of the International Day of the Midwife this year, which will be that of birth equity for all. Um, and you will also have a number of references and uh, time to ask any questions you may have. So this was the aim of my research. I was really interested and passionate in exploring women's experience of breach presentation and also what their perception were with regards to uh, what choices they had uh, and also what support was there available from healthcare professionals in making decisions with regards to uh, breach management. So I had three main questions that I wanted to answer with research, uh, with this research. Firstly, I wanted to know what women 
women's perception of choice was. Uh, secondly, I wanted to know what women's perception of support uh, from healthcare professionals uh, was. And finally, what women's experience of being diagnosed with bridge presentation uh, will be um, at, that, at the time of diagnosis as well. Um, I just wanted to make a point when I uh, mention the word women, I am talking about women and birthing people, uh, but I may use the you know the, the terminology women more often than not, uh, but we are advocating the use of inclusive language throughout the presentation. So to give you a bit of an introduction for those of you who may not be midwives or for those of you that may uh, want to know a bit more about bridge presentation. So when it comes to the definition of what bridge presentation means, bridge is defined uh, by the basically the presentation of a buttocks or a feet presenting first, as opposed to a head down presentation. Uh, but actually, uh, the term is defined in different ways depending on you know which author you go to. And in fact, there was a Canadian conference that focused on bridge a couple of years ago, and they called the conference "Heads Up: What's a Simple Way of Describing a Bridge Presentation." The incidence of bridge presentation at term is three to four percent. Now we have to remember that at around 28 weeks or so, the incidence is around 25%. And what happens is there are physiological changes taking place in the body that will allow for baby's uh, buttocks or head to come down. There is also relaxation of the lower segment of abdominal muscles that will hopefully um, allow for better engagement. And then gravitational forces as well will uh, mean that baby's head comes down. And this is why the majority of babies will turn to a head down position by uh, four terms. So that is around 37 weeks. When it comes to breach management, there have always been a variety of options available to women and birthing people, mostly uh, elective cesarean section and also a uh, breach vaginal birth until the term breach trial was published in year 2000. And I'll go a bit more into detail about that in a second. What we saw following the publication of the breach term trial was a rise in cesarean section that was completely unprecedented. Um, um, at this moment in time, I'll talk to you about the guidance in the United Kingdom. In theory, we're meant to be uh, offering a full spectrum of choice to uh, birthing people and women, uh, which include the use of complementary and alternative medicine, the use of um, ECB to try and turn bridge babies um, onto a head down position. So that would be external cephalic version. Um, also uh, bridge vaginal birth and elective cesarean section or emergency cesarean section if required. Um, and this all aligns with um, national drivers such as the better births uh, dated 2016, and also the NHS long-term plan 2019, but we are encouraged to recommend and make sure that women and birthing people have got access to a personalized care plan and choice. But in practice, what we know and what women tell us is that they have limited choices and there are variations in what choices are available to them, depending on which part of the country they are. Um, and this is something that we have to tackle and we have to change. Um, um, up until now, the majority of the research that has been done on the subject has focused on offer and success uh, of the different interventions that we are offering, but there has been very limited evidence regarding women's lived experiences. So let me take you on a journey. This is what I did. So I felt that in order to examine uh, the uh, find an answer for the questions that I had, I had to have a good understanding of bridge research. So what had been done up until now when it comes to systematic reviews and randomized control trials, so that I knew why we were offering certain options or, or, or others. And then from that, I moved on to uh, any research related to perception and knowledge. Um, from there, I looked into the quality of information giving, uh, and this is uh, reported from uh, service users mostly. And then finally, I tried to search for research on women's uh, experiences. So let's start with the first one, and that will be bridge research. 
So the Tambridge trial, for those of you that may not be familiar with this, is also known as the Hannah et al. trial or the Tambridge trial um, collaborative. Um, and what happened was that this is a multi-center international uh, trial that uh, took place mostly in Canada um, and USA, but it included lots of different centers from different parts of the world. They included the total of 2,088 women in their study. And what they found, and actually the researchers didn't even manage to complete the trial because halfway through, they realized that there was actually an 87% reduction of neonatal mortality and morbidity in the elective cesarean section group. So what they did is they felt that there was an ethical and moral responsibility to stop the trial and stop offering vaginal breech birth. Um, to, to the population at that time, or at least genetically. Um, a number of years after, uh, there have been a, a number of publications from uh, researchers highlighting some concerns and professional criticisms with regards to the Tambridge trial. So a number of things uh, were identified that actually uh, were concerning uh, to these uh, main uh, um, researchers uh, to include limited internal and external validity. There was also a violation of the inclusion criteria in participating centers, which was only discovered years after. Uh, there was also a variation in the standards of care. So for example, when comparing a UK hospital with a hospital in Mexico. We just have different systems, different protocols, different ways of working. Um, they also highlighted a lack of professional expertise to the point that actually there were centers where uh, medical students were participating in the delivery and that violated the inclusion criteria itself. Um, and finally, there was a criticism that we were trying to extrapolate uh, short-term findings and outcomes towards long-term ones. And in fact, a couple of years after the publication of the HANA trial, there was a follow-up of all of those babies that were deemed to be severely disabled um, following a vaginal breech birth. And out of 18 babies uh, that were deemed as such, 17 were found to be neurologically normal two years after. So what happened is that, um, you know, the HANA trial was published very rapidly. Um, it changed practice. There was a complete decline in the offer um, of a vaginal breech birth in many countries. Um, and there are reported rates going down from 72%, uh, uh, you know, of obstetricians offering a vaginal breech birth down to 27% in certain countries, which is quite a lot, as you can imagine. Um, the years have gone by and we have learned that there were lots of limitations to the with HANA trial, but also there have been further studies uh, published highlighting that actually giving birth vaginally to a bridge presenting baby can be as safe as uh, having an elective cesarean section for as long as we follow a strict criteria. So I'm giving you some examples here, um, including the Primoda study, for example. Uh, there is a, now a publication quite recent, 2018, about um, bridge vaginal birth at home, and also a very recent publication uh, about upright uh, vaginal bridge birth as well. Um, and I am really pleased to let you know that uh, Dr. Walker is actually um, undertaking a research for NIHR called the OptiBridge Project. So we will hear a lot more about this. Uh, but to summarize, you know, we were too quick to change practice. And actually, I'm not sure that we did, um, you know, women any favor or babies in that respect. Um, we're now going to move on to perceptions linked to knowledge. So quite surprising data here, sad at times. There are publications out there highlighting that 87% um, of women who are actually eager for information regarding bridge presentation have to turn to books or family and friends to find that information, um, which I find really sad because we're meant to be here to be helping them in that way. Um, uh, ECV uh, uptake date, so this is external Catholic version of only 39%, but actually 72% of women in some studies tell us that they want to be part of a shared decision making with other healthcare professionals, but yet they are turning to uh, leaflets and books to find information about bridge presentation uh, because they were unable to access professional advice in a timely manner.
And there are other studies as well highlighting that actually the uptake of ECV, which will be really helpful to turn the baby uh, head down, um, it's actually uh, increased when women feel that information is provided to them. So we also have a responsibility here to be a bit more responsive in that sense. Moving on to the third element, and I'm just checking the clock, um, the quality of information. So there are publications out there telling us that one third of women um, are telling us that they were not aware of what options were available to them when they were found to have a bridge presenting baby. Um, and also that uh, very often obstetricians influence their decisions. Um, Stapleton telling us that midwives weren't always able to accommodate women's needs when they were having consultations with them. And this is how women felt actually. And finally, uh, women telling us that they expect autonomy and support when making informed decisions. decisions. Finally, when it comes to women's and healthcare professionals' experiences, um, there are studies out there telling us that women uh, rely on obstetricians and midwives to provide information, but yet we've heard that uh, midwives are not always to accommodate that in their current practice. Um, and, and it's very important that they've got access to us so that they can help construct meaning of what, what British presentation means to them. And finally, uh, women's feelings as well. So the majority of women hope the baby will turn, and for some it will happen, but for some others it won't. And they just feel disappointed when um, you know, version doesn't, uh, is not successful. I'm quite doubtful about which way they should be uh, going ahead with regards to mode of birth. Um, they go through an emotional journey, this is what they tell us, um, and they also perceive that uh, healthcare professionals have got a, a preference for elective cesarean section. So I'm now going to spend a bit of time, without boring you too much, about the research methods that we utilize, and I'll give you a rationale. And um, if anyone's got any questions about this, we can uh, go back to these slides in a minute, because it can be quite complex uh, if you're not used to qualitative research. But when it comes to the research approach, I went ahead with a qualitative uh, research uh, approach. I feel very passionate about qualitative research, um, and the way in which this is defined, I couldn't really find a holistic definition, so I have mixed two of them and I hope that this makes sense. So it's an objective process used in examining subjective human experiences using non-statistical methods of analysis through the collection of narrative and subjective human um, experiences as well. So the, the um, main purpose of my research was that of uh, exploring the subject, so it's exploratory research. And by that I mean that by concluding the research, we're not aiming to generalize the findings, but instead the findings from this research may be utilized by you or other um, researchers or healthcare professionals in their practice if they feel that they apply to their population in that sense. When it comes to research designs, we went ahead with uh, phenomenology. Uh, I feel very passionate about this particular research design. So it's a non-experimental research design that aims to explore and search for understanding about people's lived experiences. And what's really interesting about it is that it takes into account the physical, social, psychological, spiritual, and finally emotional needs of human beings. So basically who we are as a whole. Um, the setting and the population was a UK district uh, general hospital um, just outside London, uh, supporting give birth to 5,000 uh, mothers or birthing people uh, per annum. Um, and the population that we care for is quite multicultural, which is one of the most beautiful things about this particular hospital, um, caring for low to middle uh, social class um, population. And this is the inclusion criteria for anyone who may be interested, but pretty much low risk pregnancies up until the time when breach diagnosis is made. So we went ahead with a purposive, um, purposive sample and also it was a convenient sample. So obviously I needed to make sure that these uh, women and birthing people were presenting a breach, uh, which is really important. And a purposive sample is a non-probability type of sample. When it comes to um, this type of research and sampling, we aim for transferability more than external validity. So once again, you know, though the findings of this research and 
you know, apply to the population where I am currently providing care? That's the question that you'll be asking yourself to see if you can, you know, extrapolate the information and take it with you. Um, so in total, we identified uh, 24 women presenting in breach uh, at full term over an eight month period. Um, what we did is we uh, obviously provided them with a patient information leaflet or sheet um, and also a consent form and send them a prepaid envelope so they will read all of the information and if they wanted to participate they had the freedom at no cost to return the envelopes to us with signed consent form. So we had a total of nine respondents and six people consented to taking part in the study which is appropriate for qualitative research. When it comes to data collection, I completed face-to-face -face interviews, and these were semi-structured interviews. I uh, went ahead with this type of um, uh, interviews because I wanted to give people the freedom uh, to talk about their birth experience, but I also had the responsibility to guide them through a, a script that was flexible enough um, to um, allow them to um, talk about whatever was relevant to them, but also find an answer to my research questions. Um, I remain quite flexible with regards to the location of the interviews. So some of them took place in a hospital environment and some others took place in people's homes. Um, I use an interview clip that had previously been validated at a, another study that was quite uh, similar. Um, and before I went ahead with it, I undertook a pilot study to test the tool and the feedback was actually quite positive. It worked quite well. So the mean length uh, interview time was 20 minutes and research participants were always made aware of their rights as with any other research to obviously um, withdraw from the study if they wanted to and also um, you know, to have their data removed. Uh, but obviously confidentiality was adhered to at all times. Um, Data analysis, so I transcribed the interviews word by word, paying attention to the tone of voice as well and any sides that they made at the time. Uh, it's really important to remember that if you're thinking of using this approach in the future, uh, 10 minutes of tape recording we, will actually take you around 60 to 70 minutes of transcription, um, especially if the language in which you're interviewing is not your mother tongue. It, you know, it may take a bit longer, like it was the case for me. Um, but I uh, completed A4 transcripts, which were validated by the individual. So basically, once you uh, transcribe everything that you've heard, you send it back to the person that you interview, and they tell you if you know if that's what they said or not, and if they agree to what, what you're writing. And also, my academic supervisor helped with this, which adds reliability to the study. I made use of bracketing, uh, transparency, consistency, and conformability at all times. And I also aim for prompt analysis of the data. This is quite important so that you don't forget about the size and anything else non-verbal wise that may have happened at the interview. Um, and also for you to make sure that there are no queries so that you can go back to the participants quite quickly. Finally, we adhere to national guidance with regards to um, application for ethics. Uh, so we went through IRIS and also uh, NRES, and uh, we um, basically adhere to confidentiality and data storage and security as well. Um, any sensitive issues that came up were escalated through supervision and also management. And it's very important that you differentiate between your role as a clinician and that of you as a researcher, so that women and birthing people don't feel that their care will be compromised if all of a sudden they decide to come out of the study. So let's talk about the, the results. Um, I'm going to be using Colise's framework and we won't really have the time to go into it because I'm trying to summarize four years of um, a, you know, a master's dissertation <laughs> into 30 minutes. But if anyone is interested, you will have my Twitter account and email address. Feel free to get back uh, to me and I'll forward you any information that you may, may find helpful. But in uh, essence, what you do, what you do is you try to do a thematic analysis of the information. And I came through 84 significant statements that were clustered into 15 thematic areas, and finally four emerging themes. I'm going to talk to you about those four emerging themes, starting with women's feelings of so the impact of bridge diagnosis. This is what women told us. They felt uh, shocked. 
uh, uncertain, quite disappointed and frustrated following diagnosis. And these feelings were actually exacerbated if breach diagnosis had taken place quite late in their pregnancy or if we were already interfering with the process of birth, so like, you know, induction of labor or anything like that. Um, there were actually a significant amount of women, five out of six, for whom uh, breach was diagnosed quite late. And they had doubtful thoughts and answers, uh, unanswered questions as well. Um, they felt that certain procedures could have been prevented, such as induction of labor, had they known the baby was presenting breach. Um, women tend to report optimism if uh, there is early diagnosis. So this is, these are just some of the quotes, and I let you read them. But for example, um, a woman said, I was in the midwifery unit and got rushed to the labor ward. So obviously this is someone who is in labor um, and just found to be breach presenting. You can just imagine how shocked they must feel. They are aiming for a, a low risk birth and all of a sudden they are in theater within five minutes having an emergency cesarean section. Um, let's move on to the second theme. So women's health care expectations with regards to breach care. So once again, when it comes to accessibility and care provision, uh, the, these variables are affected by the timing of and the response to diagnosis. So women have quite strong emotions, actually. Um, and some women reported concerns with regards to accessing care. Um, there were women who felt neglected, stereotyped and discriminated. I found this really heartbreaking and I'm sure that many of you will do as well. Um, and I'll talk about this a bit more in detail in a second. So women perceive certain uh, skills to be core skills in midwifery practice, such as palpation, so making a breach diagnosis through palpation. And women's experiences were different if they were accessing NHS services or if they were reaching out to a chiropractor or someone who was able to provide a complementary uh, alternative medicine through private services. So here you have some of the... Um, Answers. One of them that I, you know, every time that I read it, it just breaks my heart is that of uh, I feel that I was, um, there was a bit of uh, negligence. This, this uh, mother, um, uh, in English was not her first language either. Um, I felt like another pregnant woman being Asian. Uh, it is really heartbreaking. Um, and I'm sure that you will agree. So when it comes to women's preferences and making bridge decisions with guidance, so overall women reported good care. They were less satisfied with antenatal services and the care that they had intrapartumly or postnatally. Um, they felt that they had some information, but that, that information mostly came from obstetricians and that uh, they, obstetricians, influenced women's choices. So instead of consenting, uh, sorry, instead of um, making a decision themselves, they were consenting to a decision that was already being made. But generally speaking, uh, they would offer either elective section or ECV, but also vaginal bridge birth was, was mentioned. Um, so once again, the fact that we're mentioning vaginal bridge birth doesn't mean that, uh, you know, this will be offered as a viable option for all. So that concept of making a decision versus consenting to a decision that somebody else has made. So here are some examples. The doctor said we will do an ECV, and that was it. That's that's not you know consenting to a decision really. Um, um, and then someone else said I didn't feel very wrote it, uh, but they said the cesarean section was the best option. So obviously they you know they fully trust us in that sense. Finally, women's values. Um, professionalism, trust, and safe outcome. So this was really interesting, and I found this quite moving uh, in a, a positive sense. So uh, there were certain personality traits that women um, identified and behaviors from the midwives and the obstetricians that helped. So being caring, uh, being calm, uh, being comforting, feeling safe, and, and also, you know, uh, seeing people that, seeing that people were acting quite quickly was quite um, uh, helpful to them. Um, the professional behavior, friendly staff, efficient and naturally honest. I love that. Somebody said that. You really thought that we were being naturally honest, not just doing our jobs, which is uh, great, um, I think, as well. Um, so, you know, once again, to read one of the statements, I felt like people were generally there caring for you, and that made a huge difference. So to summarize, yeah, you know, the, the, the main findings, uh, and actually what we're doing now is we're answering the uh, main uh, research questions as well. Um, when it comes to perception of choice, 
when pe women basically tell us that uh, choice is there, but only on demand, they have to ask for it. And yes, there are talks about so that in section ECV and breach of vaginal birth, but not everyone have access to complementary and alternative therapies. A late diagnosis was always seen as a negative uh, feature, of course, and that, that difference between choosing and consenting to an obstetric-led decision. Uh, when it comes to perception of support, uh, women felt that there were access barriers and, uh, you know, there, there is an expectation that they'll have access to care, uh, but actually the care that they received doesn't always correlate with their expectation. Um, and what's really important, and this is one of the recommendations that we made, is that we need to enhance antenatal care and make sure that obviously we implement continuity of care, um, but also looking at those uh, big themes of, you know, women feeling neglected and discriminated, uh, particularly women from a uh, black and ethnic minorities. And apologies about the use of the terminology, BME. Um, I don't necessarily agree with it, and I don't think that it is representative of absolutely everyone who we are trying to uh, capture. Um, I'm really looking forward to a better term uh, in the future. When it comes to breach experience, uh, finally, maternal feelings, uh, you, you know, we've already talked about those, uh, but, but women felt that care was not always meeting their expectations, and so women felt quite vulnerable, um, you, you know, with regards to uh, the management of the birth that they had dream, dreamt of for nine months, and all of a sudden things are changing, you know, in that sense. So a number of limitations here, so limitations to the, with the research methods we use, so the use of convenience and um, purposive uh, sampling. The Haythorn effect, I don't know if any of you have heard um, about the Haythorn effect, but basically it's where part participants behave in a different way just because they are being watched and they're being heard. Um, and this is something that we have to bear in mind as well. Uh, the bracketing uh, was attempted at all times, so this is where the researcher tries to block his or her own thoughts uh, and answers to the questions or perceived answers to the questions so that we can analyze the data objectively. And then any others related to qualitative research. And I'm just going to speed up because of timing. So things like, uh, you know, things that we do to try to uh, mitigate uh, limitations to the, with qualitative research will be uh, aiming for rigor, transferability, credibility, conformability, and dependability, which we've already mentioned. So a number of recommendations, you won't be surprised to hear that I will be talking to you about continuity of care today because uh, this will hopefully address some of the issues that women reported they had with regards to accessing information. Um, we as midwives have a responsibility as per our regulator to make sure that we are able to offer effective care and that we are able to communicate with women and birthing people at all times. But of course, uh, I don't want to underestimate the pressures that we are under in certain parts of the world. Um, as NHS providers, uh, we need to look into uh, defining and developing specialist bridge services, and this is something that happened as a result of this research. So uh, the trust where the research was undertaken now have a, a dedicated midwifery-led bridge uh, clinic. And if anyone is interested, please contact me and I'll direct you to the right people because I left that unit. Um, Fully implementing guidance that advocates for promotion of choice as well, really important. And finally, the big subject of Black and Asian women and how, uh, you know, some difficult to reach groups struggle to access care as well. So I uh, will be ending the uh, chat saying that further research with this particular population is required to explore their, their experiences of care. So uh, nearly done now talking about birth equality for all, which is the overall um, an overarching theme for today. We need to maximize access as there are access to services that are free of charge, uh, particularly in countries that offer NHS services. We must improve uh, antenatal care as well, make sure that everyone has got access uh, to uh, the care that we deliver and that there is good provision of uh, services. And finally, uh, being aware of women's feelings and vulnerability. So I have talked to you quite a lot about the way in which certain women felt during the study. And I am so pleased to let you know that there has been loads of research undertaking on uh, um, women from a black and uh, ethnic minority population that are highlighting that we have to tackle this problem. There is so much more that we have to do to make sure that outcomes are safe for, uh, for, for women who are 
belong to um, this group um, as well. So a couple of references there for you. We won't, we won't go into detail about that. Uh, but there are uh, maternity drivers now that focus on black and ethnic minorities, which is amazing from maternity transformation program, also public health England and the better births uh, aiming to provide continuity of care to 75% of uh, people from a BME background by 2024. So a number of references here for you, and I just wanted to end with a quote that I absolutely love. And this is for anyone who may actually be thinking of wanting to make significant changes where you work and wanting to change the world. I know how you feel. And this is what I wanted to do as well. When I first started looking at the subject of bridge, I just felt that this was going to be mission impossible. But actually, if you feel passionate about a particular subject, you will go all the way. And I'm not just telling you because I've gone through that myself, but also because I've got inspirational friends um, and people that I work with that do this day in and day out. So, of course, I had to quote the one and only Barack Obama today. Um, and this is what I want you to remember as well. So change will not come if you wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for and we are the change that we seek. So always remember that it is in your hands and you've got the power to make things possible. So don't underestimate what you can do as healthcare professionals. Thank you so much to absolutely everyone attending this conference from once again, different parts of the world. Um, and I am here to help answer any questions that you may have for me. Uh, please tweet about today at Midwife Sierra as well so that we can celebrate the subject of bridge. And um, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask them now, please. I'm gonna have a look at the public chat. Elisa, I don't know if you've picked any questions um, yourself. Uh, yeah, I have uh, a lot of comments. Yeah, I have seen questions. Yeah. So? I've seen Loredana is asking um, about uh, moxibotion. Absolutely. Yeah. This is something that we implemented. Thank you, Loredana. This is something that we implemented in the clinic, moxibotion, which is an alternative therapy um, that has been used uh, you know, in China for many years, was actually implemented in the British Clinic. So women have access to moxibotion from 34 weeks, and they continue to have access to that as well. Loads of studies. I can remember um, Italian studies um, highlighting the effectiveness of Maxi Washington in turning the bridge presentation. And actually, for those of you that don't know much about it, um, when it comes to uh, moxie washing, even if moxie doesn't turn the bridge presenting baby, it makes the success rate of ECV higher and greater. So, you know, there are, there are no complications to it if you meet the criteria. And I will strongly advise the, uh, women look into it. Absolutely. I can see that you're an acupuncturist as well, which is absolutely amazing. Yep, I agree with you. I believe the vaccine works as well. Um, so Mary Kronk, yes, yes. I obviously I have um, spoken to Mary Kronk um, in the past and I happened to give her a call. I came across her telephone number and I just, uh, I was very brave. I'm not very shy. Um, and I happened to call her and she just picked up the phone and we started talking about bridge birth and I felt the luckiest um, person on earth. If I'm completely honest, Linda, that was really inspirational. And I have read loads uh, from Mary Cronk as well. Um, just quickly going down. So Jane Evans is another person that, that uh, obviously works with Mary Cronk as well. Um, and absolutely inspirational as well. Going out to home births to support women have uh, a bridge for vaginal births and uh, we've been to a couple of study days and we've um, collaborated in the past in organizing and arranging study days locally. Um, I'm just reading through the comments. Yes, yeah, so people are sharing their experience. This is brilliant. Um, I I have been very fortunate to be present at a number of uh, bridge vaginal births and thankfully the majority of them have actually gone ahead. Uh, they've been quite straightforward. I am quite proud to call many of them physiological bridge births. Some others have been um, assisted 
bridge parts and some others have been bridge extractions. But um, yes, it's really important. And I was quoting one of the studies before, um, up, you know, the position of the mother when mums are in all four, when they are upright, uh, how beautifully bridge babies come through. Um, and that's been my experience as well. Thank you so much for sharing that. People are interested in implementing a bridge service. That's absolutely fine, not a problem. Just to let you know, we were also trained as midwives to do the um, external Catholic versions ourselves. So uh, watch this space. And if you want to, we can forward you any protocols. I'll contact the right people and you'll have the protocols with you within uh, 72 hours. I pledge to that. So, yes, midwives and obstetricians in the United Kingdom receive yearly training to support a physiological bridge birth, but obviously um, I think that it will be a fair statement to say that we have become the skill because of the HANA trial. Uh, you know, we haven't proactively um, um, advised women to give birth in uh, vaginally to the bridge presenting baby. So the skills that we currently have are not the skills that we used to have once upon a time, but we're working very hard in searching for um, and designing resources to support training in that sense. Um, correct. So someone is asking, is my research being published? So I have had a, um, an approval from the British Journal of Midwifery. Uh, the research was going to be published this month, but I think that they've been inundated with uh, COVID uh, studies. And I am being told that the research will be published in August, September. So watch out for it and you will be able to reference the study as well if you undertake any future research. But very happy to share anything that I may have yeah, that's right, the Cartini Italian study, that is the one. Thank you, Loretana. A beautiful study as well. Uh, reported conversion rates of um, as high as 87%, if uh, my memory doesn't fail me uh, in that sense. You're absolutely right, Rihanna. Uh, Rihanna, sorry, you're telling us that doctors get the most of their experience from midwives, and that's right. I've been in bridge births where the obstetricians have kindly asked if they can just wait by the corner, and I've said absolutely right, yes, of course, um, but always making sure that there are good communication systems in place so that if they're not experienced, that there is another person that you can escalate your concerns to so that they can be readily available in that sense. Um, and, you know, we've had beautiful experiences recently of uh, mums. Uh, there is a particular service user who I care for who was uh, presenting with an undiagnosed bridge. And, you know, what it's like, we all started panicking. Uh, I, I wasn't panicking really, but you know, we were a bit interested uh, at the time. And um, um, actually, this was her uh, fourth pregnancy, and she had given birth to her three previous babies uh, in breach and vaginally. So, to her, she just couldn't really understand the panic mode because th that breach was normal to her, if that makes any sense, which was beautiful as well. So uh, I've got someone, Lourdes, I'm asking if there are any uh, uh, plans to uh, undertake another research once we have implemented the uh, recommendations. This is a really valid point, Lourdes. I will definitely look into do it, doing this in the future. Uh, it may need to be with a different population because I've moved on from the place where I was. Um, but uh, it's a very valid question, and this will be the only way to test if what we've implemented really worked. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I've got people telling me that it will be great to implement a clinic like this. Please get in touch and I'll be very happy to share everything with you. Um, Elisa, you're thanking everyone. I don't know if anyone had any other questions that you wanted us to talk about. I think that we will soon be running out of time. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, we have to. Unfortunately. <laughs> Could I kindly take this opportunity uh, to thank you all for um, sparing an hour of your time in this uh, beautiful evening to, um, you know, uh, pay a bit of attention to bridge presenting moms and birthing people who also deserve, um, you know, our dedication and care. Um, I wish you a, a good day. Uh, please celebrate widely. And for those of you who are of a midwifery background or anyone else who supports midwives, um, 
thank you for your contribution to society. Thank you for supporting moms and birthing people, giving birth safely, whatever you are. Um, we learn so much from your practice as well in different parts of the world. Uh, we uh, are really inspired by the amazing work that takes place in um, um, under resource, uh, under resource countries as well as uh, developed uh, countries. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you for your care to to women and birthing people. You you're actually the reason why uh, women, birthing people, babies, and their families exist. Thank you for your time today, and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>